Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We appreciate you guys taking the time to join us for Going With The Flow, flow monitoring versus flow management. Today, we're gonna attempt to clear up some of the common confusion in the realms of flow monitoring and flow management and relate it to how you are running your systems and how you're managing your systems, as well as using flow to maximize the efficiency of your runtimes to fit into watering windows. There's a lot to come. I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Dave Schaup is a senior product manager for controllers and electronics here at Hunter Industries. Dave's been with Hunter for a long, long time, and he's got a, a huge database of knowledge on these controllers, and he's been around from the IMMS days to the Centralis days and ACC to ACC2. So he is a great guy to ask questions to about these processes that we're gonna talk about today. We will bring those questions up at the end, like I mentioned, and hopefully we can get some of those confusions squared away. We also have Ryan Bushman, sales manager from Utah. There's a little typo on the screen, it says Colorado, but in that mountain states area, Ryan Bushman is a great contact to have if you're in that area. So take down his email, and if you have any questions, please reach out to him. Spencer Phillips is down in Florida. He is our sales manager on the call from the east. And Spencer has been in the field working with contractors. He's actually out in the field today working with contractors, I think, probably working on some flow. Maybe not, but Spencer has a lot of industry knowledge and has many years of experience with these topics. So that's why we asked him to be an expert on the call. With that being said, I wanna turn it over to Dave to drop us right into the meat of this presentation. Dave, we take it away, please? Thanks, Greg. Happy Thursday, everyone, if it's Thursday where you happen to be. It's Friday Eve. I am not wearing that garish purple tie today that was in the photograph. Um, I do wanna talk, the focus today is primarily flow management, flow monitoring, how we use those terms and what they do in some depth. To put that in context, this is generally related to the ACC2 controller, and I wanna just quickly recap what our super controller does. This remarkable controller has been out a few years now and in the decoder version, about two years. Uh, it had a radical new user interface that is language selectable and completely text and menu driven. Uh, it is compatible, the decoder version is compatible with all Hunter ICD decoders. And this product will control up to 225 decoder stations plus master valves and sensor decoders. Some of the key specs, if, uh, you, if you use conventional wiring, uh, of course we have a conventional version of this in many configurations, it will go up to 54 stations, expandable in six station increments. If you're a two wire person, it goes up to 225 stations in 75 station increments. Either configuration will also handle up to six flow sensor inputs and up to six pump master valve outputs. In the picture, I'm showing the power supply board where all our connections are made so you can kind of see what's on board and ready to hook up. Uh, we also have a dedicated solar sink input for weather adjustment plus three additional click sensor inputs for anything you like. And if you look in the standard configuration <clears throat> built right into the controller, there's three flow sensor inputs, three PMV outputs. Either of these can be expanded to six as needed by several different means. There's a flow expansion module, or in two wire systems, we can dedicate a decoder to additional uh, PMV outputs and sensor decoders for additional flow sensor inputs. The controller can handle a large number of stations, and for that reason, it has a large number of programs. So every ACC2 has 32 programs on board with up to 10 start times each. They can have up to 12 hour run times per item, and including, it's worth remembering that we can also do seconds resolution. So if we need to have run times in seconds, perhaps for nursery or greenhouse applications, that is an option. I think what's important to some people is the ability to run any stations in any order within a program. A lot of controllers, no matter how you enter the data, will run from lowest numbered stations sequentially up to the highest station. 
This controller will let you make the irrigation dance. The order you enter them in the program, and if you can see my screen, I have three, then two, then one, is the actual order in which they run. And that can be very useful for certain landscape applications. It also includes non-water windows for each of those programs, which can prevent unwanted watering during times of day when there's activity in pedestrian traffic. It includes a visual program summary that lets you scroll up to seven days in advance and see how your programs overlap, uh, as well as the non-water windows to see if there's any conflicts in advance. It has an enormous transformer, and the transformer can either be 120 volt or a 230 volt input, uh, either 50 or 60 hertz, doesn't matter. So whatever uh, primary AC power you have close by, maybe you're near a pump station, you can wire it up for the power that's there. The other thing about this transformer, it is unbelievably powerful and the controller is intelligent. So we can run as many things as we want and we don't have to have artificial limits on the programming because if you really overloaded the controller, it will sense the current and prevent additional things from turning on until something is timed out. In the conventional mode, this transformer has the ability to run 14 conventional solenoids simultaneously. Just Because you can doesn't mean you should, uh, but we have the power if you have the water. Notice I say solenoids, not stations. So we can run up to 14 solenoids, however they are combined in the controller, because the current draw is the same. So if you have two master valves, you could run both of those plus 12 stations, each with a single solenoid. If solenoids were doubled up on a station output, you, you wouldn't be able to run as many stations, but the current sensing would still work. In the decoder version, because decoders are amazingly electrically efficient, we can run way more. So if you have more than one output module, we can actually run up to 30 decoder solenoids simultaneously. 20 max per output module, but again, if there's more than one installed, the controller itself can run 30 solenoids and the transformer will protect itself. This is a look at the inside of the decoder one, and this one has three modules installed. So this is a 225 station controller. By the way, in the lower right of that picture, you can also see a flow expansion module. I don't know if decoder users really need that because they have the sensor decoder option, but it's another way, if all your points of connection were very close to the controller, you could just hardwire them in through that flow expansion module. So you have three built in, you can expand by three that way. The other thing I wanted to point out real quickly is that even though we have three modules that are 75 stations each, you are not locked into that for wiring purposes. As long as the other modules are present, you can assign their stations back to the first module. So if you need to put a lot more than 75 stations on a single two-wire path to the field, that's a choice you can make. It gives you tremendous flexibility in design because you could just assign stations from the second and third module back over to the first. In theory, you could run 225 stations on a single two-wire path. But the meat of the topic today was flow management, flow monitoring, how we use those terms and what they do in some detail. And they're different. So in the ACC2, flow manages the Flow management is the process of actually scheduling the stations on to stay within a specified flow rate within a given main line. Flow monitoring is what uses flow sensors to monitor the actual flow. So we use that for reporting the flow, comparing the flow in real time to the learned flow for all the stations that are active to monitor for problems which will then perform diagnostics if high or low flow is detected. And of course, uh, the flow monitoring with the sensors also reports the flow totals at the controller or via the software. Flow management is this process of scheduling stations on to stay within a specified flow rate. The flow rate is determined by the user. So we call that the flow target. And this is where you want that main line to perform throughout the evening's irrigation or morning's irrigation to stay at your design flow. 
An example might be if I had a two inch main and I want my irrigation to run at five feet per second or one and a half meters per second, which is kind of the industry standard for safe operating. It's easy to calculate that a two inch or 50 millimeter pipe, that should be about 55 gallons a minute. So I could specify that as my flow target. The flow manager will then use the learned flow rate for each station to decide which stations can run to reach the flow target. Uh, and I'll point out that flow management does not actually require a flow sensor, but it's a whole lot better if you learn the flows with a flow sensor. If you don't have a flow sensor available, you can still use this feature, but you would enter the flow rates manually by station, and that won't be quite as accurate. So the goal is to optimize the flow to run the most irrigation in the shortest period of time at safe velocities. Uh, we're just gonna let the controller figure it out. Basically, flow management gives the controller the ability to run any stations that are legal to run that day at that time in any order to achieve the flow target. The, they'll be selected based on their learned flow to fit the capacity. And they will also be considered by priority, then by the program event order. So in any given station, here's a station number eight that's attached to flow zone one. He has a learned flow rate of eight gallons a minute, and who knows where he is in the program architecture. But if we check the flow priority box, these prioritized stations will be considered first to turn on to the flow target before unprioritized stations. And that gives the user more control over how the, the events will unfold. But the important thing is that when one of the station run times finishes or times out, the ACC2 is gonna hunt around for another station that it could turn on that can fill up that new remaining capacity and stay as close as possible to our flow target. In this example, the flow target is 50. and uh, It could be 50 gallons a minute or 50 liters a minute based on your user settings, doesn't matter. The target is 50. So flow is gonna begin in program event order for all the stations that are eligible to run. But first he's gonna look down the list and see which have been prioritized. And he's gonna see that stations five and eight are prioritized. So it'll turn those on first. The total flow of those two stations together is 17.8 GPM. So the flow manager will then look through the other stations in the event order to fill the remaining capacity and get us up to our target of 50. So stations one and two would be next. Uh, they're next up and they fit in the capacity. And then we look down and station six could be turned on because that's another eight gallons, a little bit smaller increment. So he'll turn that on. That's gonna get us up to 48.8 GPM or LPM which is very, very close to our flow target, and there's nothing else that we could turn on to fill in that small additional space. So he's pretty well maxed out right now. When station two times out, his run time is finished because it was shorter than the others. The controller would then look for more stations that could be turned on to get back to the target. So the flow, total flow has dropped to 39.8, and we have a new capacity left over to get to our target, so it looks for another one. Three, four, and seven in this example are candidates to run, but three and four won't fit. Their learned flows of 14 and 13 respectively are too large to fit in the remaining capacity. But station seven will fit, so the controller will turn on station seven with a flow rate of 10. That gets us up now to 49.8, very, very close to our target. It's going to continue this process using this logic through the entire irrigation cycle. In other words, it lets the computer, the controller, figure out how to get the most done in the shortest period of time at safe velocities.
In this example, I've created a little flow graph. Uh, the odds are you will not get exactly to your flow target unless all your stations magically add up to exactly that number. We're limited by the granularity of the station flows that are available, but we will turn on and stay as close as we can to the optimum performance without exceeding the velocity all through the irrigation until we run out of things to water, and then it'll just taper off at the end. One of the key values of doing this, besides compressing irrigation into a time window, is it will also level load the electrical demand on a pump. Because if they just program by seat of the pants, that those pump motors might be cycling up and down all night long, trying to keep up with demand and then dropping off. With the optimization, we'll stay as close to design flow and avoid the wear and tear on the pumps and the cost of electricity for cycling them up and down. A couple of tips, though, that we've learned with the field. Uh, first of all, learned flow with the actual flow sensor is far more accurate than estimated flow. When you go to our flow menu, there's a learn flow function right there. And you can either tell it to learn the flow right now or schedule it to learn the flow, perhaps at 2 a.m. in the morning, because it's more accurate to learn the flow when the irrigation is actually going to occur. A lot of municipal water supplies actually fluctuate based on times of day, and it's better to learn that flow in the, the typical time window. Another tip is that you can actually set all the program start times for any given day to be exactly the same, and then check the overlap button. They aren't all going to start at 10 p.m. What this does is make a bigger pool of stations that are eligible to run and the controller will decide which ones it can turn on to get to the flow target, but it gives it more choices. It's never gonna try to run that many things at once. It's just got a bigger pool to hunt through. Let the controller do the heavy lifting. It'll figure out what to turn on. You also have the ability to limit active stations by program. This is optional, you're not required to do it, but in some cases, it's desirable to disperse flow. As we try to manage to get to this flow target, we might want to disperse it over different types of programs. One common way to divide programs is by plant management group or by plant type or by sprinkler type. So you might want to tell it, okay, you're allowed to run 20 stations in this controller, but you can't run more than two in program one. And, but you are allowed to run four, up to four in program two. So that means that he's, as he does the flow management logic, he'll still do exactly what I said, but he can only turn on two within program one to get to the target, and then it has to search around in the other programs based on their limits. And individual stations, because we flow manage by station, not by program, can be prioritized individually. If you check the flow priority box, they're the ones that get looked at first when more capacity becomes available. I'll point out uh, for advanced or experienced users, the ACC2 also has a really cool feature called blocks. And this presentation isn't really about that, but blocks are electronic groups of stations that turn on together, run for the same runtime, and then shut off together. There's a lot of advantages to that, but you don't have to do it. However, if a prioritized station is included in a block, the block also is prioritized, and that block of stations will be looked at first if any one member of the block has been prioritized. That was the flow management piece. That's what decides what's going to turn on. This is the flow monitoring piece after the irrigation begins. So we're gonna use uh, inline flow sensors to report the actual flow. Uh, in the screen I'm showing is the controller activity screen. There's a button you can push to just view flow right now. That's real-time flow for up to six flow sensors. In this case, I have six configured and each one is reporting its flow in real time. Um, the flow monitor then compares these actual flows to the learned flows for all the stations that are active at the moment and make sure that they're within spec. If it's too high or too low, 
The controller then automatically goes in and performs diagnostics, which we're going to look at to determine where or what the problem might be. And of course, this will also be used to report our flow total. We use this term called flow zone, and it has a pretty specific meaning. Uh, a complete hydraulic configuration for a, a single mainline pipe, including its water source, the master valve, the flow sensors, and any attached valves or stations downstream with their known flow rates. That's what we mean when we say flow zone, and it's potentially possible to have up to six flow zones in the ACC2. Here is a basic flow zone. This is how most of them are configured, I think. We got a mainline pipe, got a master valve, got a flow sensor in line, and then we have a collection of stations downstream that are attached to this pipe, and we have their learned flows in the controller database. This is the information it needs to complete this process. So in this simple flow zone, uh, we have in the controller a flow zone map that paints you a picture of how it's configured. So when we go to our flow menu and call up the flow zones, we can see that flow sensor one is assigned to flow zone one, the little check boxes over here, and pump master valve output number one is also assigned to flow zone one. A nice feature when you're setting this up is the controller's hydraulic summary screen, because it actually paints you a picture of the, how the flow zone is configured. We can see the manager and the monitor are both enabled. We can see what pump master valve is attached to it, to this main, what flow sensor is attached to it, and then we can scroll down, and you can see a little scrolly bar on the side there. You can scroll down with the dial and see each station that has been attached to this main line along with its learned flow rate. And this is great just to review your setup or make sure you didn't miss anything and verify that it's correct. In the simple flow zone, it's almost not necessary, but as we start adding additional flow zones, this becomes important. So the ACC2 in real time compares the actual flow to the total of the learned flow for all the running stations, the active stations. And we've seen it can run a huge amount of stations at once. It will go into the diagnostic mode automatically when all the alarm conditions have been met. The alarm conditions are defined by the user in the setup. So at the flow zone level, we can set the over and under flow allowances by flow zone, and then at the station level, we set alarm delay times, and that's because stations can be a little more finicky when they first turn on. This controls for false alarms. The ACC2 will call an alarm when the flow is under or over those specified percentages for the duration of the alarm delay setting. If it detects an alarm, it's going to let us know in a lot of different ways. One of the simplest, actually, is an optional SOS light. And this is installed and comes down one of the many conduit openings on the bottom of the controller. And this is mainly for local maintenance crews. Uh, they can basically see the status of the controller externally while mowing or gardening or whatever without having to even open the door. And the light has three modes. If it's green, everything's cool. If it's red, there's a critical alarm. If it's off, you have a power fail. So at a glance, without touching the controller, you can make sure everything's healthy. Second is the controller display itself. If there's an alarm in the controller, it flashes a red triangle at you that you can't miss, and you click a view messages button to get the the problems or whatever it's announcing. There's also a shortcut to the outstanding alarm logs in the controller. One of the best things about the ACC2 is its ability to log all events. Uh, it stores on board the last 250 events of anything that went wrong, date and time stamp to the second. And it will paint you a picture of what happened while you weren't around. And it will do that in multiple languages. Next, we can also send an SMS text to your mobile device. If the controller has been connected to our Centralis central control system, you can configure your mobile and he will send you a text in pretty much real time 
that says you have critical alarms. And in that text message there, the bottom one, I actually have two. I have a flow diagnostic failure and I have a no water window violation. Both of those occurred within the last hour. He thinks I should know about that right away and pushes them to my mobile. Finally, if you log in with the Centrala central control software, then you get all the detail that's contained in the controller. So first thing in the morning, if there was a problem last night, you've got a text message on your phone. If you click into Centralis, it paints you a complete picture of the problem. And that means you can leave the house ready to go deal with the situation and with whatever you need on the truck, maybe a pot of glue and uh, some coupling. Here's where we set the actual flow limit. So I'm looking right now at flow zone number two. You can see that we sent the high and low flow limits here as percentages of flow. In other words, if we add up the stations that are supposed to run, we're gonna allow them to run a little bit over normal and a little bit under normal in normal operations because real world flow does fluctuate. You can also set an absolute limit, you know, 200 GPM is my alarm threshold. But this, and that's an absolute limit. This is based on the stations that are running. If it's set too closely uh, in our experience, it can lead to false alarms. We don't have a laboratory situation in the field. Real world flow does fluctuate. So I like to see it about 15 or 20% over normal um, just to control so we don't get falses. Setting those limits by the flow zone definitely simplifies the setup. Um, and the, the percentages you choose are based on the stability of the, the water source. Um, so if it does fluctuate, we can give it a little fudge factor and let it continue to run. If the limits are too narrow, we are far more likely to get the false alarms. And that's just physics. The alarm delays are set at the station level. And each station has an adjustable delay. Um, what the, and what, what I was trying to say is the over and under flow percentages don't really count as an alarm for a given station until it has persisted for the period set in the delay. This also is a technique for reducing false alarms because flow is not stable in stations when they start up. There might be air in the lines, there's turbulence. So until that flow stabilizes, you can get false readings of momentary, not false readings, but not representative readings. So we give it this delay period to allow the flow to stabilize. And we can fine tune individual stations that might be problematic by expanding their delay period. Normally we wanna start out, you can set it much shorter and we do for test purposes but you wanna set that delay at one to two minutes minimum for startup. And in the real world, it is possible that stations can take longer. So you can expand this delay to keep them from falsing. So at a simple level, I wanted to show how ACC2 works its way through a flow alarm event. It's important to understand that uh, the master valve is only turned on by active stations. It doesn't come on by itself. When a station turns on, it calls for the master valve. So in this case, station one is turned on and the learned flow for that station is 14. It could be 14 gallons per minute or liters per minute. So that turns on the master valve and now the flow sensor is reading the flow and it's reading 14. So it's perfectly within range, everything's good. Um, and it's allowed to run. Now, more stations start to turn on. Station two turns on. The learned flow for station two is nine. Nine and 14 is 23. The flow sensor is reporting 23. Everything's cool, all good. Station three turns on. That adds another 14 gallons or liters to the mix and the flow sensor is reporting 37, so we're in good shape. When all of a sudden, high flow is detected, we gotta figure this out. The total flow is 47, but GPM or liters, the total of all running stations is now 125%. It's 25% over what it ought to be, and that's higher than the limit we set. 
This is actually detected by the controller, not the flow sensor itself, but I showed it for drama. And it's lasted, the high flow condition has lasted longer than the running station delays. So what are we gonna do? The first thing is ACC2 will suspend, turn off temporarily all the running stations, but it will choose to leave the master valve open. It is then going to monitor the flow level, the flow rate from the flow sensor for up to two minutes because it's looking for flow to drop. If the master valve is open and all the stations are turned off, the flow should drop. If the flow does not drop, we immediately assume mainline break. There's nothing we can do about it further downstream because we've already turned off the stations. The high flow is still gushing, so we will immediately shut down the flow zone, do the uh, post the alarm messages, notify the owner, irrigation in this flow zone is done until somebody comes out and fixes it, resets it, or after a set period of time that's selectable. However, if the flow does drop after the master valve was tested, then we know the problem is further downstream. So it's then going to test each of the stations that was running at the time of the alarm to find the bad one. So the list that was running gets to start it starts station one, that's supposed to be 14. We look at the flow sensor, check, it's good. We start station two and hey, that's running 19 gallons or liters. That's way over what was learned for that station. We're gonna mark that one bad. He'll go on, check the next station. Okay, station three checks out. He's 14, it's reading 14. It's gonna identify the station or stations causing high flow, shut them down and notify the user. But then it resumes irrigating with stations that have passed the test. So we lose the absolute minim minimum irrigation for the evening that we needed. And we still try to complete the rest of the job with things that check out. With up to six flow zones, it does that times six. And what I'm trying to indicate here is I have six different mains or sub-mains, six different separate flow zones. If there is a problem in flow zone number one, all the other flow zones continue to irrigate normally. It only performs the diagnostics in the flow zone that has the problem, and it does not affect the rest of the irrigation. So you can have up to six flow zones. Each one can have its own hydraulic definition. Each flow zone can have its own point of connection, master valve, flow sensor, and stations, and each one can have its own flow target. And that might be based on diameter of the pipe or other real world concerns, what you have to do to get the job done. But uh, flow zone one has a target of 50 GPM, he'll schedule on to that. Flow zones two and three have their own targets and they'll schedule on to that. And the controller is doing all this by itself, hanging on the wall or standing in a pedestal. So a lot of flow zones in our world aren't that simple. And a flow zone can have more than one water source. And in this kind of simple example, I have two water sources for a single flow zone. And I put a master valve and a flow sensor on each one of the water sources. And this is a question that comes up a lot. So I just want you to know that when it's configured like this, the totals for the attached sensors are added together. So we're seeing this as a, a flow zone and we might have a target number or whatever, but it has both sources and both sensors. We will add the results of the two sensors together to monitor what's going on in this main line. And that's perfectly legal and it works great. The flow map down below and the hydraulic summary below show how this would be configured in the controller. Flow zone one actually turns on PMV1 and PMV2, et cetera. Loop systems. So a simple loop is, to us, it's just another type of flow zone. Uh, you, it is important to put the master valve and the flow sensor in the points of connection to the loop, not within the loop itself. That wouldn't work very well. Uh, but this sensor is going to measure all the flow in the loop and operate it like a flow zone, because it is. With multiple POCs, same answer. There's still one big flow zone, 
but it's got two POCs, two P master valves, and two flow sensors. So the, the total flow running through each of the sensors is summed together to give us a picture of what's going on within the loop. And this will still work for flow management and monitoring purposes. And the more complicated, well, I wanted to show how it looked on the controller screens, I guess. So flow zone one has one and two assigned. It actually looks just the same as the long straight pipe with two water sources, but you can see it spelled out for you what's gonna happen in the loop. Even with more than two, in this case, I've added, uh, I've got up to four points of connection to this loop. But the total of the four sensors, because they've all been assigned to the single flow zone, are all summed together so that we can still monitor the flow station by station and do the diagnostics. The one thing we don't support or can't really support from a physical perspective is a flow sensor cannot be inside and see flow from a higher level sensor. So in this case, there's kind of a mini loop within the big loop. And that's sort of okay. But if you put a flow sensor at that point, the problem is that internal flow sensor is going to be counting flow that was already counted by the higher level flow sensor. Those numbers would be erroneously summed together, and that is not a good thing to do because you would have false alarms all over the place. So that's not what we want to do. ACC2 has another feature, and this we were asked for this by designers, called MainSafe. And it's optional feature, it's kind of cool, and it's how to have like a master master valve, or even what I might call a master flow zone. And this is only to monitor and protect a higher level of flow. In this example, there might be a very large water source with a very large mainline pipe, could be a pump station, and a long run of big pipe. When it gets out to the field, it splits into different irrigation systems. They might be athletic fields or whatever. The flow zones in the field at the, and at the athletic field, they're gonna take care of all the management and monitoring, but I want something else to protect this big water source and this giant mainline pipe because a, a break there is gonna be catastrophic. So the main safe designates uh, this master flow zone level that's above the irrigation flow zone. It can have its own absolute high flow settings. And if you're familiar with the Hunter product line, at a simple level, you might think of this as a giant flow click just for the mainline pipe. You can put in a max flow that indicates if this flow is exceeded for more than the delay time, that's a mainline break. We can't allow that. And if that happens, it will execute a shutdown immediately without going into the lower level diagnostics. This isn't station level functionality. This is catastrophe insurance. So as soon as the flow violation has persisted for the period set in the alarm delay, it's gonna shut down the mainline pipe, send you the text message, post alarms all over the place, and we're done until we go figure it out. Uh, it does have flow allowances for manual irrigation. Um, a lot of times uh, we need, if, if manual irrigation is plumbed into the automatic irrigation and they're running quick couplers or hose bibs, that's unscheduled flow. If those guys are doing that manual irrigation when no automatic irrigation is supposed to be running, uh, the controller might see that as an alarm condition because there shouldn't be any flow. So you can put in an unscheduled flow allowance, uh, in this case, kind of low, but 7.9 GPM, just to allow for manual irrigation so that doesn't cause an artificial alarm. We also have a monthly water budget, and the budget really just provides a warning to the user. And this can be in your messages and in your software. Uh, what we're saying is the main, this main safe, and this can be also done down at the flow zone level, has a monthly budget of 700,000 gallons. And if we get to that, we want an alarm. And you pick the alarm threshold that you want. What we do not do is automatically stop irrigating. 
we consider that pretty dangerous. In other words, we would automatically kill all your landscape if you've exceeded the monthly budget. So right now we don't do that. We could, but I do think it's dangerous. What we do instead is generate warnings so that the user through various means can know they're near the end of their budget and they might have to adjust irrigation or take other measures. This is kind of my ultimate main safe configuration. One controller can do all of this. You have six flow, six flow zone capability. You have six PMVs, six flow sensors. You could have two completely separate watering systems with two different main safes at the head end of each, two different flow zones downstream. So I have the, this kind of pump station high level protection. It breaks out to the individual irrigated areas and they have the local flow zone protection and diagnostics. And you can do this times six. And this is kind of the ultimate scenario that you could do within a single ACC2 controller. Every one of them has their own hydraulic limits, their own safety factors, their own over and unders, their own flow targets. Uh, a couple other things. So we have the high flow settings. This just kind of walks us around some of the settings. The max permissible flow, the time that it needs to stay there before we treat it as an alarm to control for falses. Unscheduled flow for manual irrigation. And one thing it's important to point out, the alarm clear delay. So uh, we get asked if it sees the flow alarm, how long before it will try again, try to irrigate again after that kind of alarm? And the answer is that's selectable. If you're pretty sure that your flow monitoring is real and everything's dialed in, you might wanna set this to manual only. And that's one of the choices. That means it will never try to irrigate again until a human has come out and cleared the alarm. But maybe it is prone to false alarms or maybe you're just an optimist. You can set any number in hours and minutes. That means, okay, if I saw this high flow, I have to time out for this period of time. But after say 12 hours has elapsed, it's allowed to try again. If it really is a mainline break and it hasn't been fixed, it's gonna alarm again. It's gonna go through the same process. So the choice is yours if you think perhaps that pipe will heal on its own, uh, you could set a 12 or 24 hour delay period and it will automatically be permitted to try again. If you're pretty sure you've eliminated false alarms and it's really detecting mainline breaks, you would want this set to manual only though. I would want a human to come out and inspect the condition of those lines before uh, allowing it to try again. Or we could do a lot of damage to turf and waste a lot of water. So whenever there's a flow alarm, even if this is the main controller screen, uh, even if it's not running anything, it tells you that status right up there at the top. You press the view messages button, so that red triangle in the lower right corner, that would actually be flashing to draw attention to it. Whenever you see that, you press the button for view messages, and that's gonna tell you all about the alarm situation. And this shows that it's done the diagnostics, that's over, flow zone one absolutely has a flow alarm. You have the clear flow alarm button right here. If you had gone out and physically glued up the pipe, checked it out, everything's good, you clear the flow alarms from right here and it's now permitted to irrigate again had it been set to the manual only response. So that's it. ACC2 is your ultimate flow manager. It has two powerful and sophisticated flow engines, the flow management for the efficiency and safety and the flow monitoring for measurement, alarm detection, and crisis management. And I wanna point out that it does all this in the controller itself. It does not need software, it does not need the internet. If it's set up in the field, it does all this on its own. But if you have the connectivity and the Centralis Central Control software, then you get the text messages, the ability to remotely pull in those logs and diagnose what's happening. But either way, you're covered for high and low flow conditions. And I think that was the overview right here and we can open her up to questions. 
Great, thanks, Dave. Uh, before we jump into questions, Ryan, did you uh, or Spencer, did you guys have anything to add before we jump into that? Uh, yeah, Greg, I I think that uh, this is Ryan. By the way, I would just like to add in there. Dave did a great job on the presentation there and of, over uh, an overview of the product. But keep in mind when you're doing flow managing um, or or flow monitoring, I should say to be careful on sizing your flow meter. Um, I've had numerous projects that I've come across where uh, somebody's using just say, for example, a single drip zone at a time, uh, irrigating just that single zone. And they've got a, uh, they, they wanna do the monitoring aspect of it, but the, uh, the sensor that they put in, the flow sensor or flow meter is not capable of reading that low of flows. And so, be sure that you look at those. Some of the, the meters are capable of getting down to a, a 0.2 gallon per minute ratio where others are not starting until two to five gallons per minute. And so I wanted to throw that in um, just as, as a reminder for people as they're looking at that, as well as installation process for the, uh, the flow meters or flow sensors themselves. Keep in mind that you'd uh, typically want to use shielded uh, 18 gauge minimum wire for that to reduce any of the uh, electrical noise that might be coming through from uh, running in, in trenches with some of the uh, the traditional wiring the two pot two wire path or conventional solenoid wire um, those are those are some key items that they want to re remember and then there are as dave alluded to two different ways that we can install uh, those flow sensors and, and bring those back to the controller one is hardwiring them directly uh, and the other would be using the sensor decoder systems that we offer um, to be able to bring those back in. So those are my key quick takeaways I wanted to throw into there. Thanks, Ryan. Yep, and, and Greg, this is Spencer. So I just wanted to add to Ryan, if uh, Dave's gonna touch on the subject a little bit, that uh, the most common question I receive is what types of flow meters do we accept for the ACC2? So, if Dave, if you could just recap that one one time for us. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, ACC2 runs uh, actually a very broad range of sensors. Before we publish compatibility, we do like to get sensor models in here for testing and verify because there's a lot of variation between how sensors read out. With that said, when you go to configure, and this could actually be a, a webinar topic in itself someday, and just might become one. Uh, when you go to configure a flow sensor in the ACC2, you get a choice on that screen. You can pick Hunter, and if you select the Hunter button, you get a list of our model numbers. So it makes it very easy. If you're using a Hunter sen sensor, you'd pick HFS FCT150, for example, and it would configure it for inch and a half sensor. If you check Other, which is perfectly fine, you get two additional choices. Is it going to be a K-factor type sensor, which is frequency-based, or is it going to be a scaled pulse type sensor, where each pulse represents a finite amount of water? It might seem like a small difference, but it's actually a pretty big one. With a lot of sensors that are out there, they are velocity-based, and that's where you enter a K-factor and sometimes an offset. And what that does is tell the controller to count the clicks coming in and the controller figures out how many liters or gallons per minute that represents based on the K factor. If you select the other type, the scaled pulse, that means that each inbound click from the field represents an amount of water. In other words, uh, in some of them, one click equals one gallon, or one click equals 0.1 gallons or liters, depending on how that sensor is configured. We can work with either one of them, but you don't want, with those scaled pulse sensors, you don't want those really large chunks. For example, one click to one gallon, when you get into your lower flow situations, that is a very slow output for us. So what we like is a very high click rate. You can't generate a click rate we can't read in irrigation. Uh, what we want is a very high click rate so that when we go into the diagnostics, we can break it down to station level. And if we go into diagnostics and we're only getting one click every second or two, 
that's not enough information for the controller to work with. When you get down to 0.1 or better yet 0.01 per click, and some of those sensors permit those settings, that is getting to where, where we need to be to actually do the real-time flow monitoring. So if it's a coarser click rate, your totals will be generally accurate, but the ability to do real-time station level flow monitoring is greatly hindered. A kind of a, 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 I will call it a welcome trend in our industry lately on the flow sensors has been the emergence of, uh, I'll say ultrasonic or electromagnetic sensors, many of which have tested marvelously with the ACC2 controller. And what they allow, uh, among other things, is the ability to read a very broad range of flow within a given diameter of pipe. And the added benefit generally of no moving parts in the water flow and anything to get damaged. If you have a question on a specific flow sensor, please contact us uh, via your sales manager or however, because we may have already tested one and we think it's good, or maybe it's one we're interested in and we'd like to get a sample for testing, because we want to keep expanding the range of compatible flow sensors. And I want to keep this brand agnostic, so I'll just throw that out there. A lot of brands you already know already work with this product. Thanks, Dave. And to stay on the topic of uh, flow sensors, what options do we have for a wireless flow sensor? So Hunter has a WFS wireless flow sensor with a license-free line of sight range of up to 500 feet or uh, well over 150 meters. Um, and there's one version for international, a different version for domestic. It's basically a version of our HFS sensor, which is a plastic impeller, and it's mounted in the T for the size of pipe, what we call an FCTT. And those are available from one inch through four inches. If you get the WFS variation, then that puts a little antenna mushroom cap at the very top of the valve box, and that's what communicates back to a receiver at the controller. And that is a third option. So uh, as I think Spencer Orion said, that you can hardwire a flow sensor, you can connect it to a sensor decoder, and the third option is to use a wireless receiver, uh, very handy if you're gonna retrofit, and get up to 500 feet uh, to a sensor in the field. And a second part to that question is, have you tested the creative sensor technology, CST wireless sensor with? Yes, ACCP? they're known compatible. They test well. Um, they have a new smaller one, the ELF for ELF for extremely low flow. That is also tested and both, no problem. Fantastic. Now, there's a question that came in in regards to Ryan's comment about the shielded wire. How critical is the shielded wire for communication versus a sheeted two or four? Yeah, I think I every manufacturer has. I think every flow sensor manufacturer has a rep recommendation for their wiring. And I won't um, presume to know all the, the other recommendations. Uh, the shielded wire is good with very long runs if you're running parallel to other wires that have power on them, even 24 volt power. I don't think decoder wire itself is much of a threat, but the longer any pulsing type device or clicky type device runs, uh, the more susceptible it is to picking up some electrical noise. So the, the I, I would say the shielded cable is the best practice and not necessarily required for very short runs, um, but it's really more of a sensor requirement than a controller requirement. On the hydrowise meter, the HC flow, it is recommended uh, shielded cable, I think, at any distance, and some of the other manufacturers may or may not specify that as well. So you recommend if you're going to have the flow sensor wires, communication wires in the same trench as the other wires in the main line to use that shielded cable? Yes, it's what I call a best practice. And if it's called out in the, the specifications, then it's a requirement. 
Okay, perfect. That's why I say we should do a whole other webinar someday on just flow sensor <laughs> connection. Okay, absolutely. Uh, there's a couple other questions that were very um, specific to a situation that I'm going to send to you after the presentation that you might be able to follow up with. But otherwise, as far as questions go, I think we covered them all and we're coming up on our time to finish here. So thank you guys so much, Dave, Ryan, uh, Spencer, if you're still there. Well, then from all of us here at Hunter Industries, thank you for supporting us. Thank you for staying with us uh, with your business and we hope you stay safe out there we hope you stay healthy and we'll see you on the next webinar or in the next training thank you so much and have a great day